Hello and welcome to What's in the Night Sky for December 2024. My name's Hayley and this month's highlights include the bright planets Venus, Jupiter and Mars, ray craters on the moon and the constellation of the month which is Pisces the fish. Let's begin by taking a look at the planets. You can see that I'm looking towards the south on the 1st of December at around 5 o'clock, so just after sunset. And we've got Venus low in the southwest, Saturn over here in Aquarius, and if we pan around, we've got Jupiter just risen in Taurus. Venus has been looking wonderful in the evenings towards the end of November and it's going to be improving through December. So at the beginning of December, it will set shortly after six o'clock. But if we go all the way until 31st of December, you can see that we have Venus for much longer. So there we are at six o'clock, still visible at seven o'clock. It'll be around eight o'clock by the time Venus sets at the end of the month. So you'll have lots and lots of opportunity to see Venus in the evening skies. You won't be able to miss it. If you look towards the west just after sunset, it will be the brightest object in that part of the sky. Moving on to Saturn, if we go back to the beginning of the month, you can see that we've got Saturn in Aquarius and Saturn is visible for most of the early part of the night until around 11 o'clock at the beginning of the month. If we compare that to the end of the month, you can see that we lose Saturn a bit earlier at the end of the month. So if you want to catch Saturn this month, then the, the early part of the month is the best time to do it. And Jupiter is shining brightly in Taurus all night, every night, throughout the month of December. So Jupiter is really, really good planet to look for um, during December. It reaches opposition on the 7th. And if you decide to explore this part of the sky while you're looking at Jupiter, you've got all of the gems of Taurus as well. You've got Aldebaran, the angry eye of the bull, the Pleiades, seven sisters, open star cluster. So this will be a, a nice part of the sky for you to explore during December while you're taking a look at Jupiter. And of course, if you have a small telescope, then you can have a closer look at Jupiter, see if you can spot its four Galilean moons and see if you can make out the um, north and south equatorial cloud belts uh, and the, some of the structure in the clouds as well. If you ha if conditions are good enough and if your uh, telescope aperture is big enough, you might be able to make out some details on Jupiter as well. Jupiter isn't the only planet reaching opposition this month and a reminder that opposition is when the planet appears in the opposite side of the sky to the sun from our vantage point so is the best time to observe it. Uh, the other planet that's going to reach opposition this month is Mars and if we go back to the beginning of the month we'll zoom out a little bit and we'll just bring time onwards until we have Mars rising in the constellation of Cancer. So Mars is quite close to the Beehive Cluster in Cancer. You can think of it as a little red bee buzzing around near the beehive. And if we take a look at the situation as the, the month progresses, you can see that Mars is getting a little bit higher as the month goes on. So any time in December, um, after about nine o'clock, if you go out and look for um, a the reddish hue of Mars shining in Cancer and you might also like to train your binoculars on it and see if you can see the beehive cluster as well. Mars is also the subject of a rare planetary occultation by the moon this month which is always really exciting but it's slightly complicated by the fact that it occurs during daylight which doesn't have to be a barrier um, but does make it a little bit more difficult. And that is going to occur on the morning of the 18th of December. So let's zoom out a little bit and go to the morning of the 18th. I'm going to go to nine o'clock in the morning. And I'm going to pan around to the west. And you can see that we have a gibbous moon over here shining in Cancer. We won't be able to see any of the constellations, so we'll get rid of the constellation labels there. I don't think this moon will be very difficult to spot if you have a clear sky because it's at a gibbous phase. It will be quite bright, even in daylight. I think you'll be able to find it. 
Make sure you're aware of where the sun is because you don't want to accidentally look at the sun whilst you're out doing your daytime astronomy. So be aware of that. And then you can train your binoculars on the moon if you have them or a small telescope. A small telescope that is able to track might help make this a little bit easier for you. And you can see that Mars is just here approaching the moon. I'm going to go in a bit closer as if I had a telescope. It's unlikely you'll be able to see Mars with your naked eye. So you will need some kind of equipment to be able to do this. And then you can just watch as Mars approaches the moon. And I'm actually going to centre on Mars. So for me, here in Leicester, the occultation occurs at around 9.24. And the reason I say to go out around 9 o'clock is because you want to be able to watch the approach and also the time that this begins will vary depending on where you are in the country. So it's worth going out a little bit early to make sure you don't miss the start of it. And then it disappears behind the moon. We have that, that helpful red crosshair to show us when it's going to re-emerge, which for me is going to be at around 20 past 10. But you can see that in my landscape that I've got here in Stellarium, it's gone behind a tree. So the other thing that you're going to want when you observe this occultation of Mars is to make sure that your horizon is not obscured because it gets quite low by the time you get towards the end of the occultation. With my planetarium software, I can cheat and change the landscape to something that looks a bit more suitable. Much more difficult to do that in reality than it is to do it with some computer software. So now I can zoom back in and we can take a look at the last bit of the occultation. So we're at 10.13 now. So you can see 10.14, 10.15 for my location here in Leicester, Mars emerges from behind the moon and then you can watch them start to separate as they set together around half past 10, depending on how clear of a horizon you've got. Let's stay with the moon now, but we'll head back into the evening skies. So I'm going to go to around nine o'clock on the 7th, and you can see that the moon and Saturn are quite close together on the 7th. I'm going to place the constellation names and labels back on for us now that we're back in the night sky. And if we go forward to the 8th, you can see that the moon is still quite close to Saturn. So 7th and 8th, you can see the moon pay a visit to Saturn. And if we keep going, and watch the moon track across the night sky towards Jupiter and Taurus and the Pleiades. So it makes a very close approach to the Pleiades on the 13th. So you might like to try and see if you can see those together. The moon will be very, very bright because it's nearly full. So you might struggle to see some of the light from the fainter Pleiades, but it's definitely worth having a go. And then Jupiter and the moon on the 14th as well. Full moon occurs on the 15th. So you can see that the moon is nearly full here. And we'll go to the 15th. It's moved over a little bit. And here's our full moon, which is really frustrating this month because very close in Gemini we have the Geminids meteor shower and the Geminids meteor shower peaks on the 14th um, which is right next to the full moon so this year is not a great year for the Geminids that doesn't mean you shouldn't go out and try and see some because the the light from the moon will wash out the fainter meteors but you might still see some bright ones so if you're out observing anyway certainly stay on the lookout for some Geminids meteors Thinking about our moon watch target for this month. So over the last few months, we have been exploring some of the seas and lakes on the moon, particularly in the northern part of the moon. And I thought this month we would revisit two of the beautiful ray craters on the moon, which are the Kepler and Copernicus craters. We'll take a closer look at those. So I've changed over to our more detailed lunar mapping software which will give us a better look at these two craters so Kepler and Copernicus are great examples of ray craters 
Um, ray craters being craters where you can easily see the material that has been flung out of the crater during the impact. So the, the Tycho crater down here is a very famous example of a ray crater, and you can see the rays extending outwards from the Tycho crater. And then you have Kepler, the smaller Kepler, and the larger Copernicus are two other really beautiful examples of ray craters. And whatever equipment you have available to you, whether it's your naked eye or a pair of binoculars or a small telescope, you should be able to take a look at these two craters. Copernicus is the first one we'll have a look at. So we'll zoom in a little bit. And Copernicus is 56 miles across. So easier to see than Kepler because Kepler is only 20 miles across. Binoculars should pick it out nice and easily. Um, and you should even with your binoculars be able to see the ray system as well. Through a telescope, you might like to look for these terraced walls, this uh, this terracing structure around the, the walls of the crater and three central peaks in the middle. Named after Nicholas Copernicus, who in the 1500s suggested that planets orbit the sun rather than the earth, which at the time was a very radical idea. And Kepler. If we zoom in and take a closer look at Kepler. Named after Johannes Kepler, who famously came up with the three laws of planetary motion in the 1600s. And again, you can try and take a look at some of this structure around the crater and we can zoom out. And we can see this lighter material that's been flung out and is making this system of rays uh, extending outwards from the crater. As always, when you're observing the moon, it's worth taking a look at any features that you're looking at in particular when they are close to the terminator because the shadows that are cast can enhance your view of the thing that you're trying to look at so on the 15th we have the full moon we've got kepler kepler and copernicus over here tycho down here and i've gone to the early morning now so this is about six o'clock in the morning before sunrise because we can keep the moon above the horizon as we see go through the phases and you can see that when we get towards the end of the month you have the terminator falling over the kepler and copernicus craters so definitely worth having a look at them when the moon is full and having a look at them when they are close to the terminator as well let's take a look at our constellation of the month now which is pisces the celestial fish I'm just going to go to a more sociable time of the night. And move us around to the celestial ocean. And last month we looked at Cetus, the sea monster. You can see close by we have Pisces, the fish. I'm going to put the art on for you now. So that you can see that the fish are depicted as two fish with a rope connecting them. You need a dark sky to be able to spot Pisces because none of the stars are particularly bright. This is a good time of year to look for it. So if you haven't seen it before, now is the time. If you are struggling to find it, then you can use some pointer stars to get you there, do a little bit of star hopping. Um, so to do that, we will take the art away again for a moment. So if you find the Big Dipper, it's one of the easiest shapes to recognise in the night sky. And go from the Big Dipper to the North Star, Polaris. And you do that by taking these two stars in the at the end of the pan of the Big Dipper and following them along until you reach Polaris, the North Star. Then, if you draw an imaginary line from any of the Big Dipper's handle stars through Polaris, and double that distance you should come to Cassiopeia, the Queen. So choose any handle star. I'm going to choose this one. Draw a straight line up to Polaris, double that distance, and here I am at Cassiopeia, the Queen. Finally, if I now, remembering where Polaris was, draw a line through um, Polaris, going through Caf, one of the stars in Cassiopeia, to reach the great square of Pegasus. So I'm going to spin around here and here we go Polaris, Calf, the great square of Pegasus and you should 
hopefully be able to pick out the great square of Pegasus. That's not too difficult to do. And then we have Pisces, the fish just below. You can find the uh, circlet. Um, this uh, little asterism here is called the circlet, which is the head of the western fish immediately below the great square of Pegasus. Let's bring the constellation art back and look at the story of Pisces, which means the fish in Latin. The two fish here represent Aphrodite and Eros in Greek mythology, otherwise known as Venus and Cupid in Roman mythology, who tied themselves together and transformed themselves into fish in order to escape the monster Typhon. It's host to a number of exoplanets, including a super-Earth discovered by the Kepler Space Telescope, and SETI, which is the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, searched for signals coming from the planet but found nothing. If you have a pair of binoculars or a small telescope handy, you can look below the western head of the fish and see if you can find Neptune, which resides in Pisces this month. So Neptune is too faint to see with the naked eye, but your telescope might reveal that it has a disc rather than being a point of light like a star and that that disc has a bluish colour to it. And the final thing we'll take a look at in Pisces is a spiral galaxy called M74, so Messier 74, and it's quite close to this star along the rope here. And this star happens to be the brightest star in, in Pisces as well. So if you can find that, M74 is quite close by. It's likely that you'll want to look for it with a tracking telescope, and it's too faint really to see with a small telescope. So you're going to want to look at it with a telescope that has a diameter of at least 150 mil or six inches anything smaller than that and you might struggle. It has approximately 100 billion stars and is around 30 million light years distant from the sun. Um, it's one of the more difficult messier objects to spot so if you do manage to see it then um, you can tick that one off and know that you've managed one of the hardest messier objects um, in the night sky to, to see. Finally, if you would like to spot Santa returning from delivering the presents on Christmas morning, otherwise known as the International Space Station, if you are up nice and early, you can head outside on Christmas morning at around six o'clock and there should be a pass of the International Space Station starting at around two minutes past six and that will take about five or six minutes to go over. That brings me to the end of our night sky tour for December 2024 and I wish you clear skies for all of your observing this month.